Kitakato, Kia ora Kato, Kato. A very warm welcome to the Right Honourable Helen Clark, distinguished guests, academic colleagues, students and members of the public. My name is Professor Grant Guilford, I'm the Vice-Chancellor of Te Hiringawaka, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university and New Zealand's first ranked university for research quality. This week is Toi Tu Te Ao, Sustainability Week at the University, during which we are focusing on the criticality of sustainability through a wide range of talks, debates and other events. Tonight we have the immense privilege of an evening with the Right Honourable Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, as she discusses sustainability with Jill Greer. In this conversation on sustainability, Helen Clark will bring to bear her vast experience in government, policy and global affairs, all working to solve deep and complex problems. Serving for three successive terms from 1999 to 2008, Helen was the first woman to become an elected Prime Minister in New Zealand. Throughout her tenure as a Member of Parliament for 27 years, she engaged widely in policy development and advocacy across the international affairs, economic, social, environmental and cultural spheres. She advocated strongly for a comprehensive programme on sustainability for New Zealand and for tackling the challenge of climate change. For instance, her fifth Labour government established New Zealand's emissions trading scheme. In 2009, Helen made New Zealand proud when she became the administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, the first woman to lead the organisation. She served two terms there and at the same time was chair of the United Nations Development Group, a committee consisting of all UN funds, programmes, agencies and departments working on development issues. As administrator, she led UNDP to be ranked the most transparent global development organisation. Helen continues to speak widely and to be a strong voice on sustainable development, climate action, health, peace and justice, and gender equality and women's leadership. Helen, it is a great honour for us to have you here this evening. Thank you. Jill Greer, who will be facilitating tonight's discussion, is a phenomenon in her own right. Dr Greer was Chief Executive of Volunteer Service Abroad and the National Council of Women and Executive Director of Family Planning New Zealand. She is also a former Director General of the International Planned Parenthood Federation in London where she oversaw an annual budget of 125 million US delivering services to women in 189 countries. Dr Greer became a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2005 for services to family planning and to literature and was also recognised in 2012 with a CBE from the British Government for services to international health and women's rights. Jill has also had a long association with this university. She was our Director of Student Services and Assistant Vice-Chancellor, Equity and Human Resources in the 1990s, as well as a member of the University Council. Uh, she is also a well-respected author and an expert on Catherine Mansfield, and completed her PhD here as well. As a Capital City University, we feel a particular responsibility to foster the kind of conversations you will enjoy tonight. We have a strong commitment to sustainability, and if I single out climate change, five of our staff are lead authors for the next report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of the largest groups of authors from any organisation to be involved in preparing this we are determined to ensure the results of our research on climate change enrich our teaching and our organisational practices. For instance, we were the first New Zealand university and one of the first universities in the world to initiate divestment from carbon emitting fossil fuels. And later this week, Climate Minister the Honourable James Shaw will be joining us for our launch of our comprehensive new emissions management programme to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Climate change and other aspects of sustainability are the defining issues of our time. And I do hope you take advantage of our other events during Sustainability Week to learn more about them and to discuss how they might be addressed. I'm sure we can expect insights of plenty this evening and I invite you to join me in welcoming the Right Honourable Helen Clark and Jill Greer. So thank you.
ora tato, and uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor, on behalf of us both. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you both to the students and staff of Victoria for organising such a fantastic event as a Sustainability Week. It's just great, and to think that you've worked on it together um, as well, it's even better. So I'm here to introduce Helen, who needs absolutely no introduction. So let's hear it for Helen Clark. So Helen has become, I think, um, an absolute leader for sustainability. Uh, far from um, retiring from UNDP and leading a quiet life, she's just begun her foundation with three papers out already and is truly a global leader um, on these issues that we're going to talk about now. So I think we're very lucky, Helen, to have you back home. I know how much you're away at the moment. You've often said that 2015 was a remarkable year. It began with the Sendai framework on disaster risk management. It continued with the end of the Millennium Development Goals. There are a lot of goals in this conversation, I have to warn you. And then it continued, of course, with the development of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals with over um, 100 indicators. That's why I say there's a lot of goals in this conversation. And then we had the Addis Ababa Agreement on Financing for Development. And all of this in the one year. Today, across in New York, the United Nations is assessing how far we've come in that time. Mm. And I can think of no one better than Helen Clark to give us an idea of what progress we have made in those five years. And today they're talking about this month being the beginning of another 10 years of activity and delivery. And that's part of what we'll talk about as well. So Helen, SDGs, all of those acronyms that you get out of the UN, can you just briefly talk about the Sustainable Development Goals and how they were different from the Millennium Development Goals? So thank you, Jill, and thank you to the university for inviting me along. Well, I, I spent eight years in New York uh, at the sort of end of the period of the Millennium Development Goals and through the transition to this new uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals came out of the Millennium Declaration, uh, which was issued by world leaders who came to New York for the Millennium Summit. And for those of you who can remember the dawn of the new millennium, it was actually a time of quite a lot of hope uh, that you know, maybe we could have a, a better millennium uh, than the, the one before. And uh, Kofi Annan uh, you know, spurred the diplomats to negotiate you know, the, the visionary Millennium Declaration. And then out of that came the, the eight goals, which were, which were referenced in the declaration. But uh, for years, there was a bit of a feeling that actually the diplomats hadn't negotiated the goals, so they didn't get as much traction as perhaps they could have uh, early enough. But the point about the Millennium Development Goals was that they were largely uh, aimed at what developing countries needed to achieve. Uh, that was the, you know, largely the, the first six goals. There was an environmental one that was seventh but didn't get a lot of traction. And then a partnership goal. And of course, core to the partnership is always money. And uh, the internationally agreed goal for developed countries like ours is to devote 0.7% uh, of, of gross national income development assistance. And only half a dozen countries have ever achieved that, and one of those doesn't do it today. So uh, money was always uh, an issue. But uh, towards the end of the Millennium Development Goal period, there was the Rio Plus 20 uh, UN Summit on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro, 20 years on from the Earth Summit of 1992. And that major conference mandated negotiations on a sustainable development agenda, which would not be about things that developing countries needed to achieve, but would actually be a universal agenda uh, applicable to all countries from you know, New Zealand to Somalia, basically. Uh, and it uh, set out to 
promote a holistic way of, of looking at development so that uh, you shouldn't be mortgaging the future of, of, of future generations with the way you trash the environment. You know, we need stable ecosystems. We need our biodiversity. Uh, so when we're thinking about development, we need it to be you know, consistent with maintaining uh, ecosystem integrity. And of course, traditionally, development hasn't been about that. It's been about, you know, pollute first, and then if you get to be a rich country, you clean up later. But it's a, it's a struggle, uh, as, as we know ourselves with the st state of our waterways, and China knows with the state of the air in its cities, and so on. So, yes, the Sustainable Development Goals were many more in number than the Millennium Development Goals, which has been a problem. You know, you can just about remember eight goals, but 17 is a struggle. Uh, the eight goals from the Millennium Development Goal era had 29 targets. This agenda has, I think, 169 and well over 200 indicators. So it's quite complicated. Um, but notwithstanding that, uh, many countries have embraced it fulsomely. Uh, at UNDP, as the, ag the agenda became you know, very clear, even before it was signed off at the summit in 2015, uh, UNDP was leading missions into countries that looked at how you would integrate the sustainable development goals into national plans, policies, and budgets. Because actually, these agendas all stay as bits of paper, you know, getting dust on shelves, unless countries really care about them and grab them and take them home and say, this is important to us and we're going to do something about it. And not just at the national government level, also in one of my roles as patron of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, and it has been pushing for the SDGs as it pushed for the MDGs to be embraced at the local government uh, level. Um, so also implicit in the new agenda was a very high level of civil society participation, uh, endeavour to get the private sector on board because how it does business will have quite an impact on whether development is inclusive and, and sustainable. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great agenda. It's in the right direction. Uh, we should see the Paris Climate Agreement as in synergy uh, with it. Uh, because what's happened to the climate ecosystem is a sort of subset of the issues which uh, uh, affect uh, uh, natural ecosystems in, in general. But uh, I'm probably anticipating a future question of, of Jill's. But He's stolen them all. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Crossing them off. <laughs> if, if you tried now to negotiate the agreements of 2015, you couldn't do it because of the political changes in key capitals. Uh, and it's a pretty obvious what one of them is. But uh, I mentioned uh, Rio plus 20, Rio de Janeiro. I mean, Brazil was host of this major conference, and you had, at that time, governments in Brazil that actually cared about the Amazon you know, and cared about in, in inclusion and, and ecosystems. And you know, now you have a president who's you know, basically incited people to set fire to it. So you know, these changes are... are, are really very, very uh, destructive. And I think uh, at, you know, the least we can say for democratic societies is you do get a chance to vote again from time to time. <laughs> so the, the UN system and those who care about these agendas must hang on to them and must keep working at them in the hope that the tide will turn in some key capitals and you can get you know, some more action and buy-in again in the future. Helen, you did a very unusual thing around the SDGs at the very beginning. It's not often that the UN actually goes out to people like us and says, what do you think? What are the issues? So you did what I think was pretty much unheard of. You arranged for a survey around the world. Would you like to just talk briefly about that and, and what the results of that showed from the world we want? Well, I think, again, it was, a, it was a lesson from the Millennium Development Goals, which were, as I say, came out of a declaration that was negotiated by diplomats in New York and didn't really get traction in capitals for a long time. And then when the goals were promulgated, that was done at a sort of hierarchical level in the UN. And so th there wasn't the engagement you want from societies uh, around the world. So uh, yes, in my time at UNDP, I had people there who said, we should change this. You know, it's clear there's a mandate from Rio uh, to negotiate this new agenda. But let's make sure the negotiators, the diplomats, actually hear voices of people from 
around the world. So there were three sets of consultations. Uh, one of them was the Global Online Survey, which eventually attracted 10 million responses. And it, it listed a whole range of areas, every conceivable thing that, that could be in the SDGs. And it said in the survey, uh, identify the goals that are most important to you, or the areas that are most important to you to be reflected in these new goals. Now, globally, what came out top in whatever order was access to health, uh, access to education, and access to work, right? And probably pretty much mirror priorities here, wouldn't it? If we've got the health system right and we've got you know, adequate income and we can get the education that we aspire to, you know, this is pretty important. But interestingly, the fourth priority that came through globally was honest government because a lot of countries don't have transparent and accountable government. And citizens know that. You know, they know that you know, governments steal, governments don't work in the public interest in many, many places. So that was quite, quite interesting. And probably had an impact on the sustainable development goals. For the first time in development goal setting, having a goal on inclusive and responsive governance for peaceful societies. Uh, which wasn't liked very much by uh, quite a lot of autocracies. But on the other hand, there was a, a sort of you know, a, a bow wave behind it. So that was one uh, rather important input. Then uh, UNDP, which has, up until after my departure, been the lead agency in the system, uh, led on uh, getting agencies to support national consultations on the SDGs and close to 100 countries, overwhelmingly developing countries, ran these. And you know the bottom line for the UN facilitating them was very, very wide participation uh, to make sure that from across the society, social groups, ethnicities, indigenous people, the poorest and most marginalized got a voice. And, and then that, of course, puts some pressure on the diplomats from those countries to be, um, you know, sort of listening to, oh, is that what people want? You know, we, we better reflect that. Uh, and there were also global thematic consultations that were hosted in a, about 10 capitals, so environment, health, uh, equality, uh, education, et cetera, et cetera. So all, all of this was to give a groundswell of opinion from civil society, uh, both uh, community level, uh, NGO, scientists, researchers, you know, whoever you could bring into this conversation. And I think that's really important to think about because what you have in the SDGs really is a desire for a more just, equal, sustainable world. So that, that builds that whole idea of sustainability. And so often people think about sustainability mm. as just about the environment, <coughs> don't they? But mm. in terms of human rights, for example, any comments there, Helen, around the importance of the SDGs in terms of social justice and human rights? Yes, well, <laughs> this SDG 16 about peaceful and inclusive societies uh, based on the rule of law <laughs> is, is very, very important. And it, it gives you know, something to hang on for, for civil society advocating in situations that can be very, very, very difficult. I mean. If you look at what the UN has contributed to humanity since 1945, one of the most important areas is in the whole human rights pantheon of, of declarations, treaties, uh, protocols, and so on, uh, which you know, set, set a standard uh, that countries can aspire to and advocates can hang on to. And, and you could say in you know, quite a number of countries more honoured in the breach than the observance, but it, it's very important to have that sort of set of norms uh, that people can, can have as a reference, if, if you like. Um, so yes, the, the SDGs uh, can be supportive of that. What was the other aspect of that, of that question? You asked I've completely human. forgotten. You've completely forgotten. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm busy thinking of the next one. <laughs> In fact, I, I think it's important too to remember how critical New Zealand's role was um, 
in the development of both the League of Nations and of the UN as well, mm -hmm. and in terms of human rights. Mm -hmm. One of the differences, I think, too, that Helen and I would both regret in some ways is that the SDGs are not a convention or a treaty or a covenant. So therefore, they don't require a legal, or they don't have a legal status in terms of the commitment. But then you wouldn't have got agreement on a treaty. You no, see, that's this, <laughs> it, it's very difficult yes. now to negotiate new treaties in the uh, rather polarized world that we, we have. And you know, one of the last significant uh, UN rights treaties that was negotiated was the Convention uh, on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And New Zealand played a leading role in that. The amb Ambassador Don Mackay was one of the lead, lead diplomats on that negotiation. The United States has never ratified that. And you know, in certain contexts, wouldn't even have gone along with the agreement because you have to have every state agreeing uh, to uh, to these uh, uh, treaties. So the SDGs were always, you know, it was a negotiation in the General Assembly. It's not binding, uh, but you know, you get buy-in. I mean, the governments all come and sign it. They they parade before the high-level political forum to to talk about what they're doing about them or not doing about them. So there's a kind of you know, moral pressure. And, and my pick is that as the years go on, there'll, there'll be a bit of a panic about lack of progress. And I can come back to the lack of progress in a moment. And you'll see more concerted activity probably in the last five to seven years than you see at the moment. That's exactly the way it was with the MDGs. There was a, a rush in the last, uh, the last five years. So we have then a 193 countries which did sign up to the Sustainable Development Goals, to the SDGs. And just as a reminder, um, one is about climate change. Number 17 is about partnership. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's probably the most important partnership between the private sector and government, between civil society and academia, and um, government and the private sector. Mm -hmm. So that's critically important. Interestingly enough, we just did a... Um, as you know, a survey of 186 organisations here to do a people's report on New Zealand's progress, and, and uh, that was interesting in itself. But same two, health and education were placed first as the most important to New Zealand today. Mm. And the one, sadly, that was placed lowest mm. was SDG 17. So there's something happening there's something in the water, if you like, at the moment about people feeling um, not so strongly about partnership or not believing it's possible. And I think that's a, an important point around collaboration. But I want to come back to one thing, Helen. You mentioned, for example, the US not signing up to the Convention on Disabilities. Uh, today, the head of the Human Rights Council, Michelle Bachelet, whom you know very well, mm -hmm. said that we have reached a point with climate change where the cataclysmic degree of global heating, she didn't use warming, will make it impossible for any nation, institute, or person to stand on the sideline. And yet the United States is on the sideline, and some of you will have heard President Trump say earlier this week, well, I wasn't elected to represent the people of Paris. Mm -hmm referring to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, work that one out. I wasn't elected to represent the people of Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, he cannot, for example, tell the difference between weather and climate. It's completely impossible, it seems. What do we do about that? <laughs> <laughs> this is serious stuff. We shouldn't be laughing. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's, it's a bit like New Zealand with its living standards framework which is the focus of the government rather than the SDGs, but the two, of course, can fit together. We just need to make it more formal. Mm. But it's not as if we are in a little bubble. We're in a world where one country's emissions, mm. and we mm. per person have a very high rate, where one country's emissions become another's pollution. Until the US joins mm. agreements on climate change mm. and the Sustainable Development Goals, what chance have we got? They are standing on the sidelines. You see, the, the, the federal government is missing in action. But in a sense, life is moving on without them. 
So when Trump was elected, he said it's going to be a new age for coal. And I think he has an image that coal is still mined by people who go down a pit with a hard hat rather than by heavy machinery. Coal is down, down, down in the States. You know, <laughs> these, these mines aren't profitable. There was uh, a report in the last, in recent months, that said for the first time, power from renewable sources in the States had exceeded the, the generation from coal. I mean, coal's on the way up. Whatever Trump says, it, it, it's, it's going down. The writing's on, on the wall. And secondly, while the, the federal administration will flail around and say these things, the reality is that in the powerhouse states, something is being done, right? California. It doesn't matter whether you've got a Republican or a Democrat government in California, they're going to act on climate change because they're so impacted by it uh, with the, the, the extreme heat and the fires and, and, and the droughts and so on. So right down that western seaboard, the eastern seaboard, progressive states that you find uh, in, in, in middle America as well, people are doing things. Cities are doing things. And that's why I always say that I've just been in Australia doing a couple of major events like, like this one, and there's a lot of depression in Australia after the last election where, you know, the state of Queensland, which uh, apparently doesn't like climate action much, um, uh, didn't go the way of change. But I say, well, okay, but fine, but you've got other levels of government in Australia which, which can act, you know, and you've got cities that can act, cities of scale. I mean, there you've got, you know, greater, greater Sydney, uh, which, you know, sort of not that far off the population of New Zealand, probably. If these major municipal areas act, you, you, you get impact all right. So, yeah, in, in a sense, I, I sort of disregard uh, Trump's rhetoric because I think there is action in the United States and there are many people who, who, who see where it, it needs to go. And you talk about cities and local government, so we're just coming up, as we all know, to local body elections. Mm. And in many ways, this is surely where the heart mm. of the sustainable development goals and also much to address climate change or the mm. climate crisis can happen. So my hope would be, and I think you would mm. share it, that everybody mm. in this room who goes to listen to mm. those standing for election mm. Mm. on whether it's DHBs, Auckland DHB, for example, has reduced its emissions by 20% in the last mm. couple of years. Mm. What would be the question you would ask somebody standing for a local body office in the next you know, few weeks in the election? What would be well, your uh, question? <clears throat> if it was me, <laughs> um, what, what I would be asking is uh, to prospective candidates, first, are you aware of the sustainable development goals and are you aware of the new urban agenda that came out of the Habitat 3 conference uh, in 2016? And if elected, what will you do to make these uh, part of the agenda for the, the city or, or, or the district. The, the great thing about local government in developed countries is that while at a national level, we you know, long ago abandoned national planning, as it were, and really have to retrofit to do things like climate action and SDGs, at the local level, of course, the Local Government Act requires participatory planning. You know, there has to be a process, a number of processes, where the public is consulted and, it, and you produce a plan. And this is ideal for something like climate action, as per Paris, and uh, for the Sustainable Development Goals. And it, you know, it, it's entirely possible for cities to, to grab these agendas and say, we want to base our plan on these. So that's what I would be arguing. And uh, you know, saying to the cities, you know, will you commit to being the, the kind of inclusive and sustainable city that these uh, agendas envisage? And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I think if every single one of us went out from here and actually asked that question, mm -hmm. we would start to make people more aware. Rotorua, mm -hmm. for example, has, has done a great deal in terms of you know, developing itself as an SDG city. Mm. And Copenhagen is apparently the most yeah. sustainable city in the world. Wouldn't it be fantastic if Wellington, for example, was mm. to be able to mm. follow in its footsteps? So I think that's an exciting way. So coming closer to home, how do you think New Zealand is going? It's just presented its first mm. voluntary national review uh, to the high level political forum last month, the month before last. Mm. Um, showing its progress, and I think Rwanda has presented five 
um, mm. reviews so far, which is extraordinary. Mm. Much of it around young people, driving change in Rwanda. But how do you think New Zealand is going? Well, New Zealand hasn't really picked up the SDGs, despite you know, them being accepted and signed off by uh, the previous government. John Key came up to the summit and you know, New Zealand sort of signed on. Uh, we're in the situation where the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda is, is highly consistent with a number of things the government's doing, from the wellbeing budget to the living standards framework to the new announcements on water, the, the climate action framework, the zero carbon bill. You know, the, there's you know, a lot of things happening. And in my opinion, it, it wouldn't be a Herculean task to say, let's put it in this, this overall framework. And that would then make uh, New Zealand's reporting and what it had to say about its work on SDGs uh, rather, rather more meaningful. I, I've had a look at the report that was put to New York and it, it didn't really address the, 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 the targets mm -hmm. at all. Uh, the People's Report, which uh, Jill and Civil Society produced, actually does go through quite methodically and, and I think is a, an excellent uh, report. Um, I mean, one of the issues in, in our system, as I say, is long ago, like other developed countries, we abandoned a sort of planning capacity. Uh, so where you put something like this in the government structure can be quite challenging. My own opinion is that uh, probably it would need to go as a secretariat and department of prime minister and cabinet and then the prime minister also has ownership and oversight of it and you have the convening power to get ministries to to work together and the key thing is to get them out of their silos and start thinking about the interactions of policy across the economic social uh, and environmental so i think you know we we, we could do this now, if you then go goal by goal, as, as the uh, People's Report did, uh, we also have some challenges with this agenda. Look, we don't have the poverty of Somalia, of course, but relative to our situation, it is quite shocking that 23% of our children are reported by our official Department of Statistics to be living in households that are under the poverty line when you take housing costs into account. And you have to take housing costs into account. They're horrific because of what happened at you know, the low end of the housing market. Not enough investment in social housing and, and uh, people uh, becoming excluded. Uh, if you look at SDG 2, which is the goal on, on hunger and food security, you might think, oh, well, what's that got to new, do with New Zealand? We don't have famine. Well, the Ministry of Health official statistics tell us that 19% of our children, that's almost one in five, live in households that are classed as moderately or severely food insecure. So we have issues on the most fundamental sustainable development goals, let alone you know, get to freshwater habitats and quality or um, you know, many, many other things. Uh, if you take and, and I do very much see the climate action agenda as you know, part and parcel of the SDG one. If you look at our greenhouse gas emission footprint, how aware are New Zealanders that little New Zealand, with its five million people, roughly, uh, per capita, is the 21st biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, per capita. We're the fifth biggest emitter in the OECD. Yes. I mean, you know, let's not think we're not part of the problem. We're part of the problem. Uh, so, you know, as I say, there is action in these areas, but it might help galvanise some more support for it if people had a higher awareness of the fact that we can't be complacent. And I think often we're complacent. We think, oh, it's all right here. Well, it's not all right. And it, it really is a bit of a call to action I'm making to, you know, for, for people to, to do what they can at whatever level, whether it's their university becoming sustainable, their city, their, you know, their workplace, uh, and, and, you know, a bottom-up push to uh, address a range of these issues. So I'm going to open the floor to questions in a moment, but I have one question before that. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, you were at the Small Island Developing States Conference in Samoa, which is also uh, in this month of September, um, being reported on at the UN. And a group of Pacific women who I think have huge regard for you met with you 
And you said to them, what's wrong? What's worrying you? And of course, they were confronting climate change and the mm. Prime Minister of Palau saying every tin of food that comes from New Zealand should have a health warning on it because of <laughs> obesity and so on. Mm. And you said, so what, what's wrong? And mm. they said, it's too big. And I think many of us think this. You know, we, we have this picture of a dystopia mm. because of mm. climate change, mm. which is very bleak. Mm. They said to you, it's too big. What can we do? There's nothing we can do. We, mm. we feel it's hopeless. Mm. Do you remember what your answer was? I said, probably said, start where you can, locally. No, what you said was, <laughs> <laughs> and I've remembered it ever <laughs> since, and um, what you said was, meta problems mm. don't always require meta solutions. Mm. Every small step mm. taken in the right direction collectively can make a difference. Mm. That's very much part of your thinking, I think. Oh, yes. But also uh, for the very vulnerable countries in the great oceans, like the, the uh, South Pacific states, they absolutely need international solidarity because they are faced with challenges which were not of their making and uh, which are very, very expensive to adapt uh, and mitigate around. Um, and uh, I guess many here would have followed what happened at the Pacific Island Forum recently, uh, where Australia's stance was just met with outrage by the South, uh, South Pacific, uh, because they are seeing the rising of the ocean affecting them in many ways. And not only by the mega storms, which are becoming more frequent and more intense, but also just you know, plain ordinary agriculture and cropping anywhere near the coastline. And, and in many islands, you can't get away from the coastline, you, you're living on the coastline. Uh, so the seawater inundation, the, the, the spray, making agriculture more difficult. And, and you can grow in these conditions, but you need adapted plants and, and technology for, uh, for that. So it's an existential threat for the small island developing states, uh, what's happening with the with the climate ecosystem. And the money promised uh, by rich countries like ours uh, under the Paris Agreement uh, for climate action has, has really not come in. The Green Climate Fund has never attracted a lot. And if you add up the, the, the bilateral aid spend, it, it's not uh, fantastic either. You also find in the climate change conversation often a, a bit of a disconnect in that uh, developing countries are very much talking about the need for support for adaptation, uh, whereas our, we need adaptation too, but we also need a major mitigation conversation. But as well, developing countries need support for mitigation in the sense that if they were to follow the development path that we had with polluting power and uh, you know, cutting down all our forests and so on, uh, they contribute to the problem as well. So support for renewable energy, for putting a you know economic value on the forest standing rather than being cleared for agriculture, and this is really the issue in, in the Amazon, the Congo yes. Basin, Borneo, <laughs> etc. Et uh, you know we're not going to resolve these issues for the Pacific, the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, Cape Verde, and the Atlantic uh, without international solidarity. No, of course, and we need the systems in place and. Mm -hmm. I think it's ironic too that whereas here we are concerned so much about rising sea levels and then of course you have spent a lot of time in North mm. Africa where we see the impact of desertification mm. um, and conflict mm. and the impact on women and mm. I think that's an area too that you mm. have a particular mm. interest in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And remembering that women are likely to be what, 25% more I think affected by climate change. Mm. So on that note, mm. we'll open up to the floor and there are microphones descending the stairs. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting up your hand and uh, mm -hmm. anyone who would like to ask, thank you, Sophie. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please do. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ivan. It's a pleasure to hear you all. Um, my question and my concern is uh, climate change, again, going back to climate change, is affecting, uh, well, increasing the number of climate refugees both in developed and developing countries. And still the Human Rights Commission 
and other organizations focused on refugees have been reached an agreement of, on how to define what's a climate refugee. Some of them uh, focus more on political refugees, some other call them environmental migrants. And meanwhile, uh, well, we can see what's happening in the Bahamas, uh, the potential uh, sea level rise affecting uh, the Pacific Islands. Jakarta is moving 10 million people into Borneo, uh, Dhaka, many examples. And still, up to this moment, there is not a proper definition of what a climate change is. Mm -hmm. So I think, although it sounds trivial, it actually affects a lot the process of taking decisions. Mm -hmm. What's your uh, opinion about it? Mm. Well, last year there were two uh, new compacts um, adopted by the international community. Uh, one was the, the one on refugees, which didn't have much to say on this area, you're quite right. But the global compact on migration, which ended up becoming quite controversial because the Americans wouldn't sign it and the Australians wouldn't sign it and, and so on. And it, you know, there was even a flurry here with you know, some people trying to claim it was a breach of national sovereignty, which is ridiculous, but of course New Zealand signed it uh, in the end. But that compact did give um, uh, civil society uh, actually a sort of step in to be able to pick up the issues of uh, uh, climate-induced uh, migration. There is a, a reference there that is, you know, at, at least mildly positive, uh, as it were. Uh, but, you know, th this really comes back then to the, the adaptation issue. How are countries going to adapt uh, to, to these forces? The World Bank uh, had a study out early last year, as I recall, which uh, projected that uh, in the worst case scenario, where, which is probably what we're facing, that you would get um, climate refugees amounting to about 2.3% of the populations of South Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. And that's a lot of people. It didn't count East Asia and Southeast Asia, which are also uh, very, very uh, badly affected. It made the point that most people, you know, fleeing from where they've lived because of climate change, will not go over international borders. They will be internally displaced people. And what what insight you gain from that is that. If people are being pushed back from villages on the coast and coming to cities, then adaptation is also about uh, how you urbanise uh, and provide for significant populations coming in from uh, either areas that are experiencing impossible and recurrent drought, like in the, the, the Horn of Africa or, or the seawater inundation in Southeast Asia or whatever. Uh, the bank study looked at some hotspots where people uh, potentially would go over borders and the extent to which uh, that uh, could be a hotspot also for, for violent conflict with newcomers uh, coming in. So there are some very, very big issues around this. But I think, I think the global compact on migration does have a framework where we can start to have a more intelligent uh, conversation around these issues. It's certainly desperately needed. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Another question? I'll take one in the front, thank you. I'll come to the back next. Hello. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were on New Zealand's stance around declaring a climate emergency and um, just any sort of theories or thoughts you might have on the implications that something like that could have in the future. Well, I mean, the the, the the situation is very urgent. Um, I suppose if you cleared an emergency, it would be a, you know, a, a call to action and, and you know, really use it to uh, propel forward the zero carbon bill and the, you know, many things that have to be done. Uh, I suppose my caveat would be that sometimes when you talk crisis and emergency, it can be disempowering as well. People think, oh, God, it's just hopeless. You know, I'll go and play golf or do something else. <laughs> uh, so I think in, in this whole debate, we need a sense of agency that there are things that people can do and, and that you should be demanding of your governments and at, at every level. 
and and that you can do in your own community and your workplace and your institution and, and so on. So, you know, if, if we're really going to get change, I think that encouraging that sort of push from the society level is, is extremely important. I, I'd be interested to know, for example, whether those of you who are in... Um, who are working, not, not here at Victoria, I don't know the answer here, but if all the organisations people work for have, for example, a climate policy and how that impacts on procurement. Or sustainability We just did policy. a survey recently and only 60% of the NGOs we surveyed, 180 something, um, had either a climate or a sustainability policy or mm. specific procedures. Mm. So that's mm. one thing that can be done along with those others. And as I say, what, what I have seen a lot of in other countries, and you will have too, mm. is the localization of a global yeah. agenda. So young people in particular leading the charge in making a difference where they live. And that's why I come back to local bodies mm. and where we live as well. Mm. And no, it's not enough by itself, as Helen says. Mm. At the back, there was a question, about mm. two rows, a little bit mm. further from the back. Yes, all right, thank you. Mm. Hi there, Carlos Chambers here. Thanks for the discussion. My question is for you, Helen, and it's, I guess, how would you characterise or describe your mental and emotional states over the, <laughs> over the journey you've been on? And I guess I'm curious about, in the face of what you described as polarisation of capital cities and kind of adverse... Some, some decent headwinds for the sustainability agenda and some slower progress. Mm -hmm. How do you get inspired and stay positive? Because you seem quite positive mm -hmm. tonight and you're encouraging mm -hmm. action and mm -hmm. talking a lot about it. So, yeah, I'm curious about how, how you stay energised. Well, you know, my, my attitude is you're a long time dead, so you might as well make, <laughs> you know, make, make the most of the opportunity you've got to, you know, motivate people to to really believe that it is possible to go where we need to go. And there are headwinds, no question. I mean, you know, don't you feel a headwind every time you open the, uh, the newspaper or turn on the BBC or look at the Times news app or something? I mean, really, uh, the most ridiculous things happening in the world. But there's also incredible people doing amazing, amazing things. And we... We must take our, our inspiration from them and, and, and support those in our own society who are you know, really trying to make a difference on these issues. Right. I think, I think that, that's very true. And I mean, there are some good news stories to tell mm -hmm. um, in many ways of the last 10 years of development under the MDGs and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But as one finance expert said, what is it? We have to stop borrowing money we don't have from... Uh, to buy things we don't need, to impress people we don't care about. <laughs> so, something all of us can do, I suspect, and that's our consumerist kind of thing. I mean, I drive a Prius and a white Prius, and I think people think I'm an Uber till I get out and they realise that <laughs> I'm too old to do it. Um, next question. Let's go over this side. We haven't been to the left, and I think we should go to the left. It's our left. Anyone over here? Yeah. Kia ora. Sally Ann Moffat. Right now, it's exciting to hear you talking about taking action. I'm trying to take action to The Wainui Amata River. Right? <laughs> Represent. Support this amazing woman <laughs> who's leading the charge against the, what the landfill's doing to the river. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. I'm trying to protect Wainui Amata River from our local body politicians who think yeah. that the... the um, floodplain of a river is a good place to put clean fill. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Helen, in a tweet to me, clean fill by any other name is landfill. That's right. <laughs> and I'm taking action and I've had, I have a website and I'm working hard. I've had a public meeting and Trevor Mallard and politicians came along and it was fantastic. But where I'm at now is the council are doubling down They've just contacted us today via social media saying that all they want to do is change a couple of truck movements in the, yeah, in their application for a consent. And I'm at a loss. Like, what do we do next? How do well, we can, not You can vote them out, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, I need to mobilise people. Yeah. And I, I, I'm only 20 minutes. Like, Lower Hutt's just down the motorway, oh, yeah. you guys. But I feel like I'm living in a third world country yeah. when the rest of the 
the world is declaring climate change yeah, and yeah. an emergency. And there's a council 20 minutes down the road that wants to put a clean fill on the floodplain mm. of the Wainuiamata River. Mm. So any more advice would be gratefully received. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the, the question to the, the candidates has to be, you know, where is the vision for where we need to go with waste? I mean, what about zero waste to landfill? What about reduce, reuse, recycle? I mean, where we have to get to is that we don't have any more landfill, right? And, and let's face it, landfills are also a not insignificant source of methane uh, emissions. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is the time to be talking about it because it's local body election time and hold people accountable. There's probably a few of us in this room that would come along with you in the meantime, I guess. A ask some as questions. a voter in Hutt Hus City. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's catch up after this. Yeah. Um, yes, in the middle. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for being here. This is wonderful. We don't seem to hear much about in the conversation about human global population. And I wondered, Helen, in your role in the UD, UNDP, um, how much is there being talked about in trying to slow the rate of growth there? Mm. Well, my opinion is that just as happened in our own society, as, uh, as women uh, get education and access to services and economic empowerment and rights, they make their own decisions, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, if you think of, um, you know, the generations of our own families, you know, I think of my grandparents who three out of the four were members of families with nine, 10 or 11 children each. And uh, we've seen family size come down dramatically with access to contraception, uh, women defining the kinds of lives they want to lead, having ed access to education. And so that's, uh, that's where the emphasis needs to be on, you know, it's, it's, it's basic human development and giving people agency, knowledge, you know, the, the, the right to make the choices about their lives. And you will see population come down when that happens. Uh, but, you know, what, one of the sad things again about, uh, and, and Jill could speak with great authority on this as well, is every Republican president of the United States from and including Reagan's time on, has cut all funding to the UN Population Fund, which does the, you know, the hard yards alongside the organisations Jill used to represent in family planning. Because unless these organisations will rule out ever saying anything positive or doing anything positive about abortion, they get all their US funding cut off. Um, so, you know, sexual and reproductive health and rights is a, is a big issue in the, in the global community. And uh, on that score, watch in November, mid-November, there will be a major UN conference in Nairobi. Uh, and it's roughly called the Cairo Plus 25 Conference because in 1994, there was a landmark conference in Cairo, which set the sexual and reproductive health uh, and rights agenda. And uh, actually, many have been scared to run another conference in case it went backwards, particularly in the current political context. But uh, it will be a, a conference where you'll see all the people really pushing for people to have access to services, to know their rights, to you know, to have empowerment, to come and you know talk about the issues. And I think generally it's summed up by a belief that women want more for their children rather than more children, mm. generally speaking if they are able to have that choice. If they have that choice. So, mm. one last question mm. then, please. At the back corner. Thank you. Hi, uh, there have been some strong messages here today. Um, and it's, my question would be about getting the message out. Because we live in an information age and there's loads of different ways of, uh, of delivering this message. Um, but the message is often lost in silos uh, of people, and I'm sure everyone here has similar viewpoints, which is why we are, uh, we've come today. But is there any uh, way forward that the delivery message of social media and your time in, po in politics um, and the advice you'd give on getting the message out or what's on the horizon? Because even with the fires that have been happening, um, it took us four to five months to get it into our media, and yet 
uh, it was only really focused on the Amazon when there was far worse events happening around the world at the same time mm. and during that period. Like, uh, it just seems to be a disconnect and how do we change that? Mm. Well, yes, I mean, think of the Siberian fires, which are also very, very disastrous. And I've just been in Australia the last couple of days. Here we are, early spring, and there are bushfires raging in Queensland and New South Wales. And, you know, we're not even near the summer. Uh, I mean, it's really incredible to me that at the Australian federal government level, they're not, you know, sort of reading the tea leaves on what's happening to the, the climate. It's uh, very, very strange. But um, anyway, how do we get the message out? In many ways, it's much easier now than it was when I was active in politics here, because that was really pre-social media. You know, Twitter only goes back to about 2008, right? Facebook was it was just sort of getting underway then. Uh, so we, we live in an age where it is easy to connect communities. Of course, you know, there is the, the point that people may live in their, their own bubble, but you know, if there are more ways of going up direct to public opinion than there ever used to be when we were dependent on traditional media uh, taking, taking an interest. But I think it's a question of you know, raising these issues, both through the social media channels, through the opportunities that present themselves with candidates' meetings for elections, local or otherwise, uh, in your own organisations, around the teacups, at the family gatherings. I mean, you know, word of mouth is a very powerful thing, and if everyone begins to have the same conversation and, and join the dots about what's happening, you know, ho hopefully it, it becomes uh, you know, some, some momentum for, for action and buy-in to what, what needs to happen here to address the issues as, as well as globally. And I think that's probably a very good note to end on, which brings us back to this idea of each of us taking mm -hmm. those steps in any way we can and joining up um, with government to do it. Helen, there's a... Um, an African saying, a Pakatoki, which goes, um, when the music changes, so must the dance. <laughs> and I think you have convinced us very clearly the music has changed. Mm -hmm. The dance that we all do must change. Mm -hmm. But there is hope, and there is a whole raft of things we won't even have begun to think of, um, just as, for example, mm -hmm. our grandparents would not have dreamed that we would lead the life we do today. Mm. And I think if people like those in this room spread the word in the way you've described, then that in itself will be enormously important. Mm. So I just want to mm. thank you on behalf of us all for your leadership around the globe. Uh, you. It is amazing. You are a, a one-woman machine um, <laughs> in all sorts of ways, but what the good that you do in, in writing and speaking and with your new foundation to raise people's awareness from all of us here, thank you so very much indeed.